Welcome back to another edition of the Fast-Paced Awaken Aware Radio Show. This is your host, Infinite Consciousness, commonly known as Jason. If you'd like to access the archive of all the past shows of Awaken Aware Radio, go to www.blogtalkradio.com slash infinite consciousness. Check out Awake Aware and Part of the Solution and on uh, Facebook. And check out Freedom from Compulsions at www.freedomfromcompulsions.vpweb.com. In our last show, we discussed the global depopulation United Nations agenda of Agenda 21 and how the elite would like to reduce the global population to about 500 million people using various methods. Tonight's show will be on the holographic nature of this third dimensional illusion that we are currently experiencing. I'd like to give credit to Crystal Links for some of the following information that was wonderfully put together regarding this topic. Let's get started. The holographic universe. The theory that reality, as we consciously experience it, is not real goes back to ancient indigenous people who believe we exist in a dream or illusion. In our current timeline, we refer to the matrix, grids, virtual reality, simulation, and hologram. Today, many physicists are researching the concept of the universe as a hologram. The universe is a consciousness hologram. Reality is projected illusion within the hologram. It is a virtual experiment created in linear time to study emotions. Our hologram is composed of grids created by a source consciousness brought into awareness by electromagnetic energy at the physical level. The hologram is created and linked through a web or grid matrices based on the linked or based on the patterns, excuse me, of sacred geometry. The hologram had a beginning and it has an end as consciousness evolved in the alchemy of time. As the grids collapse, everything within the hologram will end, helping to understand what is going on in the world today. All right. How a Holographic Universe Emerged from the Fight fight with Stephen Hawking. This is from Wired Magazine, August 1, 2011. The proponents of string theory seem to think that they can provide a mere elegant description of the universe by adding additional dimensions. But some other theorists think they've found a way to view the universe as having one less dimension. The work sprung up out of a long argument with Stephen Hawking about the nature of black holes, which was eventually solved by the realization that the event horizon could act as a hologram, preserving information about the material that's gotten sucked inside. The same sort of math, it turns out, can actually describe any point of the universe, meaning that the entire content universe can be viewed as a giant hologram, one that resides on the surface of whatever two-dimensional shape will enclose it. When it comes to the basic idea, the universe can be described using a hologram. All right, let's look at a different uh, article here from Discovery Magazine from May 27, 2011, and it's, Does Quantum Theory Explain Consciousness? Consciousness, how do you go about explaining that? Indeed, many scientists are currently studying what happens in the brain and how the mind relates to the outside world. But quantifying what gives us consciousness is proving to be a rather tough nut to crack. Is there some supernatural influence? It is purely biological? Or is there something else, something more, physics Don't you think our consciousness might be explained by the Large Hadron Collider, which is probing states of matter that existed immediately after the Big Bang? So it's bound to throw up some new physics. Don't you reckon it might uncover some sort of particle or energy that might explain our connectivity with the universe? Are we living in a hologram? Do you ever have days when you question reality? One scientist has gone a step further. He is currently building an experiment that will hopefully answer whether or not we all exist as a result of a universal hologram. You're not alone. The holographic universe hypothesis is steeped in complex mathematics and descriptions that belong in hard science fiction novels. Fernilab particle physicist Craig Hogan renewed interest in the holographic universe concept after investigating the noise measured by a gravitational wave director called GEO 600 in Germany. Before we can understand what this noise is, let alone why the universe could be a hologram, we need to understand how gravitational wave detectors work. Our reality, a mere illusion, this is from Epoch Times, December 15, 2009. According to recent research in the field of quantum physics, all of what we know as matter, the solid cement of what appears to be what our matter is composed of, could be nothing more than quantum fluctuations in the middle of an empty universe. All right, and you can also check out, I'm not going to go into this one, but a reality, a mere illusion part two, which is from Epoch Times, December 20, 2009. Uh, you and I only holograms. All right, holographic universe, discovery could herald new era in fundamental physics. I'm just going through a few articles real quick before I get to the, uh, 
the gist of everything. Uh, this is from Science Daily, February 5, 2009. Cardiff University researchers who are part of a British-German team searching the depths of space to study gravitational waves may have stumbled on one of the most important discoveries in physics, according to an American physicist. Craig Hogan, a physicist at Fermilab Center for Particle Astrophysics in Illinois, is convinced that he has found proof in the data of gravitational wave detector, GEO 600, of a holographic universe, and that his ideas could explain mysterious noise in the detector that has not been explained so far. The British-German team behind the GEO 600, which includes scientists from the School of Physics and Astronomy's Gravitational Physics Group, will now carry out new experiments in the coming months to yield more evidence about Craig Hogan's assumptions. If proved correct, it could help in the quest to bring together quantum mechanics and Einstein's theory of gravity. All right, let's look at uh, how many dimensions in the holographic universe in Science Daily, February 9, 2009. Viennese scientists are trying to understand the mysteries of the holographic principle. How many dimensions are there in our universe? Some of the world's brightest minds are carrying out research in this area and still have not succeeded so far in creating a unified theory of quantum gravitation. It is often considered to be the holy grail of modern science. I need to look at Michael Talbot. He wrote a wonderful book uh, called The Holographic Universe in the early 90s, I believe it was. Um, I read it, uh, it and it's just um, outstanding and I, I suggest this to anyone. All right, Matt, Michael Talbot was the author of several books on holograms and quantum mechanics and their relationship to ancient mysticism and the theoretical models of reality. Talbot explored the works of physicists David Bohm and neurophysiologist um, excuse me, Carl P uh, Pribram, who independently researched and conc uh, the conclusion that the universe operates on a holographic model. In Talbot's book, The Holographic Universe, Talbot also arrives – at this conclusion, it maintains that the holographic model might also explain numerous paranormal and unusual phenomena, as well as offer a basis for mystical experiences. In 1982, at the University of Paris, a research team led by physicist Alan Aspect performed what may turn out to be one of the most important experiments of the 20th century. Aspect's experiment was related to the EPR experiment, a consciousness experiment, experiment which had been devised by Albert Einstein and his colleagues Poltsky and Rosen, in order to disprove quantum mechanics on the basis of the Pauli exclusion principle contradicting special relativity. Aspect and his team discovered that under certain circumstances, subatomic particles such as electrons are able to instantaneously communicate with each other regardless of the distance separating them. It doesn't matter whether they are 10 feet or 10 billion miles apart. Somehow, each particle always seemed to know what the other was doing. This feat violates Einstein's long-held tenet that no communication can travel faster than the speed of light, which is tantamount to breaking the time barrier. This daunting prospect has caused some physicists to try to come up with elaborate ways to explain away aspects findings, but it has inspired others to offer uh, even more radical explanations. University of London physicist David Bohm, for example, believes aspects findings imply that objective reality does not exist, that despite its apparent solidity, the universe is at heart a phantasm, a gigantic and splendidly detailed hologram. To understand why Bohm makes this startling assertion, one must first understand a little about holograms. A hologram is a three-dimensional photograph made with the aid of a laser. To make a hologram, the object to be photographed is first bathed in the light of a laser beam. Then a second laser beam is bounced off the reflected light of the first in a resulting interference pattern, the area where the two laser beams um, uh, commingle, is captured on film. When the film is developed, it looks like a meaningless swirl of light and dark lines. But as soon as the developed film is illuminated by other laser beam, a three-dimensional image of the original object appears. The three-dimensionality of such images is not the only remarkable characteristic of holograms. If a hologram of a rose is cut in half and then illuminated by a laser, each half will still be found to contain the entire image of the rose. Even if the halves are divided again, each snippet of film will always be found to contain a smaller but intact version of the original image. Unlike normal photographs, every part of the hologram contains all of the information possessed by the whole. The whole in every part nature of a hologram provides us with an entirely new way of understanding organization and order. For most of its history, Western science has labored under the bias that the best way to understand a physical phenomenon, whether a frog or an atom, is to dissect it and study its respective parts. A hologram teaches us that some things in the universe may not lend themselves to this approach. If we try to take apart something constructed holographically, we will not get the pieces of which it is made. We will only get smaller holes. This insight suggested to Bohm another way of understanding aspects discovery, 
Bohm believed that the reason subatomic particles are able to remain in contact with one another, regardless of the distance separating them, is not because they are sending some sort of mysterious signal back and forth, but because their separateness is an illusion. He argues that at some deeper level of reality, such particles are not individual entities, but are actually extensions of the same fundamental something. This fundamental connectedness would correlate the fifth element and its mathematical proof of all aspects of the universe being energetically connected. Hal Puthoff's assertion in his work on uh, zero-point energy of all charges in the universe being connected and that further mass is in all likelihood an illusion as well. And both of these modern-day theories of physics being in accordance with ancient traditions and philosophies which claim the same connectedness of the diverse parts of the universe. To enable people to better visualize what he means, Bohm offers the following illustration. Imagine an aquarium containing a fish. Imagine also that you're unable to see the aquarium directly, and your knowledge about it and what it contains comes from two television cameras, one directed at the aquarium's front and the other directed at its side. As you stare at the two television monitors, you might assume that the fish on each of the screens are separate entities. After all, because the cameras are set at different angles, each of the images will be slightly different. But as you continue to watch the two fish, you will eventually become aware that there is a certain relationship between them. When one turns, the other also makes a slightly different but corresponding turn. When one faces the front, the other always faces towards the side. If you remain unaware of the full scope of the situation, you might even conclude that the fish might be instantaneously communicating with one another. But this is clearly not the case. This, says Bohm, is precisely what is going on between the subatomic particles and aspects experiment. According to Bohm, the apparent faster-than-light connection between subatomic particles is really telling us that there is a deeper level of reality we are not privy to, a more complex d- dimension beyond our own that is an- analogous excuse me, to the aquarium. And he adds, we view objects such as subatomic particles as separate from one another because we are seeing only a portion of their reality. Such particles are not separate parts, but facets of a deeper and more underlying unity that is ultimately as holographic and indivisible as the previously mentioned rose. And since everything in physics or physical reality is comprised of these um, etalons, excuse me, the universe is itself a projection, a hologram. In addition to its phantom-like nature, such a universe would possess other rather startling features. If the apparent separateness of subatomic particles is illusionary, it means that at a deeper level of reality, all things in the universe are infinitely interconnected. The electrons in a carbon atom in the human brain are connected to the subatomic particles that comprise every salmon that swims, every heart that beats, and every star that shimmers in the sky. Everything interpenetrates everything, and although human nature may seek to categorize and pigeonhole and subdivide, the various phenomena of the universe, all apportionments, are of necessity, artificial, and all of nature is ultimately a seamless web. All right, a super hologram, real quickly. In a holographic universe, even time and space could no longer be viewed as fundamentals. Because concepts such as location break down in the universe, in which nothing is truly separate from anything else, time and three-dimensional space, like the images of the fish on the TV monitors mentioned before, would also have to be viewed as projections of this deeper order. At its deeper level of reality is a sort of super hologram in which the past, present, and future all exist simultaneously. This suggests that given the proper tools, it might even be possible to someday reach into the super holographic level of reality and pluck out scenes from the long-forgotten past. What else the super hologram contains is an open-ended question, allowing for the sake of argument that the super hologram is the matrix that has given birth to everything in our universe. At the very least, it contains every subatomic particle that has been or will be every configuration of matter and energy that is possible, from snowflakes to quasars, from blue whales to gamma uh, rays. It must be seen as a sort of cosmic storehouse of all that is. Although Bohm concedes that we have no way of knowing what else might lie hidden in the super hologram, he does venture to say that we have no reason to assume it does not contain more. Or as he puts it, perhaps the super holographic level of reality is a mere stage beyond which lies an infinity of further development. Bohm is not the only researcher who found evidence that the universe is a hologram. Working independently in the field of brain research, Stanford neurophysiologist, uh, excuse me, neurophysiologist Carl Pribram has also become persuaded of the holographic nature of reality. Pribram 
was drawn to the holographic model by the puzzle of how and where memories are stored in the brain. For decades, numerous studies have shown that rather than being confined to a specific location, memories are dispersed throughout the brain. In the 1960s, Pribram encountered the concept of holography and realized he had found the explanation brain scientists had been looking for. Pribram believes memories are encoded not in neurons or small groupings of neurons, but in patterns of nerve impulses that crisscross the entire brain in the same way that patterns of laser light interference uh, crisscross the entire area of a piece of film containing a holographic image. In other words, Pribram believes the brain in, is itself a hologram. Pribram's theory also explains how the human brain can store so many memories in so little space. It has been estimated that the human brain has the capacity to memorize something on the order of 10 billion bits of information during the average human lifetime. All right, the brain is an electrochemical machine that stores information, a binary code. One of the most amazing things about the human thinking process is that every piece of information seems instantly cross-correlated with every other piece of information, another feature intrinsic to the hologram. Because every portion of a hologram is infinitely interconnected with every other portion, it is perhaps nature's supreme example of a cross-correlated system. The storage of memory is not the only neurophysiological puzzle that becomes more tracta tractable in light of Pribram's holographic model of the brain. Another is how the brain is able to translate the avalanche of frequencies it receives via the senses, light frequencies, sound frequencies, and so on, into the concrete world of our perceptions. A code, encoding and decoding frequencies is precisely what a hologram does best. Just as a hologram functions as a sort of lens, a translating device able to convert an apparently meaningless blur of frequencies into a coherent image, Pribram believes that uh, the brain also comprises a lens and uses holographic principles to mathematically convert the frequencies it receives through the senses into the inner world of our perceptions. An impressive body of evidence suggests that the brain uses holographic principles to perform its operations. Pribram's theory, in fact, has gained increasing support among neurophysiologists. Uh, Holophonics, real quick, um, another section here that's important when it comes to holography. Argentinian Italian researcher Hugo Zaccarelli recently extended the holographic model into the world of acoustic phenomena. Puzzled by the fact that humans can locate the source of sounds without moving their heads, even if they only possess hearing in one ear, Zaccarelli discovered that holographic principles can explain this ability. Zaccarelli has also developed the technology of holophonic sound, a recording technique able to reproduce acoustic situations with an almost uncanny realism. Pribram's belief that our brain mathematically constructs hard reality by relying on input from a frequency domain has also received a good deal of experimental support. It has been found that each of our senses is sensitive to a much broader range of frequencies that w than was previously suspected. Researchers have discovered, for instance, that our visual systems are sensitive to sound frequencies, that our sense of smell is in part dependent on what are now called cosmic frequencies, and that even the cells in our bodies are sensitive to a broad range of frequencies. Such findings suggest that it is only in the holographic domain of consciousness that such frequencies are sorted out and divided up into conventional perceptions. But the most mind-boggling aspect of Pribram's holographic model of the brain is what happens when it is put together with Bohm's theory. For if the concreteness of the world is but a secondary reality and what is there is actually a holographic blur of frequencies, and if the brain is also a hologram and only selects some of the frequencies out of this blur and mathematically transforms them into sensory perceptions, what becomes of objective reality? Put quite simply, it ceases to exist. As the religions of the East have long upheld, the material world is Maya, as they put it, an illusion. And although we may think we are physical beings moving through a physical world, this too is an illusion. We are really receivers floating through a kaleidoscope sea of frequency. And what we extract from this sea and transmogrify uh, into physical reality is but one channel from many extracted out of the super hologram. This striking new picture of reality, the synthesis of Bohm and Pribram's views, has come to be called the holographic paradigm, and although many scientists have greeted it with skepticism, it has galvanized others. A small but growing group of researchers believe it may be the most accurate model of reality science has arrived at thus far. More than that, some believe it may solve some mysterious mysteries rather uh, that have never before been explainable by science and even established the paranormal as a part of nature. Numerous researchers, including Bohm and Pribram, have noted that many parapsychological phenomena become much more understandable in terms of the holographic paradigm. 
In a universe in which individual brains are actually individual, indivisible portions of the greater hologram, and everything is infinitely interconnected, telepathy, telepathy may merely be the accessing of the holographic level. It is obviously much easier to understand how information can travel from the mind of individual A to that of individual B at a far distance point and helps to understand a number of unsub puzzles, puzzles in psychology. In particular, Stanslip Grove feels the holographic paradigm offers a model of understanding many of the baffling phenomena experienced by individuals during altered states of consciousness. In the 1950s, while conducting research into the beliefs of LSD as a psychotherapeutic tool, Grove had one female patient who suddenly became convinced she had assumed the identity of a female uh, of a species of prehistoric reptile. During the course of her hallucination, she not only gave a richly detailed description of what it felt like to be encapsulated in such a form, but noted that the portion of the male of the species, anatomy, was a patch of colored scales on the side of its head. What was startling to Grof was that although the woman had no prior knowledge about such things, a conversation with a zoologist later confirmed that in certain species of reptiles, colored areas on the head do indeed play an important role as triggers of sexual arousal. The woman's experience was not unique. During the course of his research, Grof encountered examples of the patients regressing and identifying with virtually every species on the evolutionary tree, research findings which helped influence the man into a uh, movie Altered States, by the way. Moreover, he found that such experiences frequently contained obscure zoological details, which turned out to be accurate. Regressions into the animal kingdom were not the only puzzling psychological phenomenon Grof encountered. He also had patients who appeared to tap into some sort of collective or racial unconscious. Individuals with little or no education suddenly gave detailed descriptions of uh, Zoroastrian funerary excuse me, practices and scenes from Hindu mythology. In other categories of experience, individuals gave persuasive accounts of out-of-body journeys of uh, precognitive glimpses of the future of regressions into apparent past life incarnations. In later research, Grove found that the same range of phenomena manifest in therapy sessions, which did not involve the use of drugs. Because the common element in such experiences appeared to be the transcending of an individual's consciousness beyond the usual boundaries of the ego and or limitations of space and time, Grove called such manifestations transpersonal experiences. And in the late 60s, he helped found a branch of psychology called transpersonal psychology, devoted entirely to their study. Although Grove's newly found, founded Association of Transpersonal Psychology garnered a rapidly growing group of like-minded professionals and has become a respected branch of psychology, for years neither Grof or any of his colleagues were able to offer a mechanism for explaining the bizarre psychological phenomenon they were witnessing. But that has changed with the advent of the holographic paradigm. As Grof noted, if the mind is actually part of the continuum, a labyrinth that is connected not only to every other mind that exists or has existed, but to every atom, organism, and region of the vastness of space and time itself, the fact that it is able to occasionally make forays into the labyrinth and have transpersonal experiences no longer seems so strange. Perhaps in creating reality, we have already become, as in Star Trek, Next Generation, um, Q Continuum, or we are part of a consciousness virtual reality experiment. In his book, Gifts of Unknown Things, biologist Lyle Watson describes his encounter with the Indonesian shaman woman who, by performing a ritual dance, was able to make an entire grove of trees instantly vanish into thin air. Watson relates that as he and another astonished onlooker continued to watch the woman, she caused the trees to reappear, then click off again, on again, several times in succession. Although current scientific understanding is incapable of explaining such events, experiences like this become more tenable if hard reality is only a holographic projection. Perhaps we agree on what is there or not there because we uh, call consensus reality is formulated and ratified at the level of the human unconscious at which all minds are infinitely interconnected. If this is true, it is the most profound implication of the holographic paradigm of all. For it means that experiences such as Watson's are not commonplace only because we have not programmed our minds with the beliefs that would make them so. In a holographic universe, there are no limits to the extent of which we can alter the fabric of reality. What we perceive as reality is only a canvas waiting for us to draw upon it any picture we want. Anything is possible, from bending spoons with the power of the mind uh, to events experienced by Carlos Castaneda during his encounters with the Yaqui Brujo Don Juan. For magic is our birthright, no more or less miraculous than our ability to compute the reality we want when we are in our dreams. 
Indeed, even our most fundamental notions about reality become suspect. For in a holographic universe, as Pribram has pointed out, even random events would have to be seen as based on holographic principles and therefore determined. Synchronicity, principle suddenly makes sense, and everything is reality, or in reality, would have to be seen as a metaphor. Even the most haphazard events would express some underlying symmetry. When Bohm and Pribram's holographic paradigm becomes accepted in science or dies an ignoble death, remains to be seen, but it is safe to say that it has already had an influence on the thinking of many scientists. And even if it is found that the holographic model does not provide the best explanation for the instantaneous communications that seem to be passing back and forth between subatomic particles, at the very least, as noted by Basil Hiley, a physicist at uh, Birkbeck College in London, aspects findings indicate that we must be prepared to consider radically new views of reality. Let's talk about uh, another article here. Uh, it's called Information in the Holographic Universe. It's in the uh, Scientific American, August 14, 2003. Theoretical results about black holes suggest that the universe could be like a gigantic hologram. An astonishing theory called the holographic principle holds that the universe is like a hologram, just as a trick of the light allows a fully three-dimensional image to be recorded on a flat piece of film. Our seemingly three-dimensional universe could be completely equivalent to alternative quantum fields and physical laws painted on a distant, vast surface. The physics of black holes and immensely dense concentrations of mass provides a hint that the principle might be true. Studies of black holes show that although in, it defies common sense, the maximum entropy or information content of any region of space is defined not by its volume, but by its surface area. Physicists hope that this surprising finding is a clue to the ultimate theory of reality. Ask anybody what the physical world is made of, and you are likely to be told matter and energy. Yet if we have learned anything from engineering, biology, and physics, information is just as crucial as ingredient. The robot at the automobile factory is supplied with metal and plastic, but can make nothing useful without copious instructions, telling it which part to weld to what and so on. A ribosome is a, in a cell in your body is supplied with amino acids, building blocks, and is powdered or powered by the energy released by the conversion of ATP to ADP. But it can synthesize no proteins without the information brought to it from the DNA in the cell's nucleus. Likewise, a century of developments in the physics has taught us that information is a crucial player in physical systems and processes. Indeed, a current trend initiated by John A. Wheeler of Princeton University is to regard the physical world as made of information with energy and matter as incidentals. This viewpoint incites a new look at venerable questions. The information storage capacity of devices such as hard disk drives has been increasing with leaps and bounds. When will such progress halt? What is the ultimate information capacity of a device that weighs, say, less than a gram of, uh, uh, and can fit inside a cubic centimeter, roughly the size of a computer chip? How much information does it take to describe a whole universe? Could that description fit in a computer's memory? Could we, as William Blake memorably planned, quote, see the world in a grain of sand? Or is the idea no more than poetic license? Poetic license. Remarkably, recent developments in theoretical physics answer some of these questions. And the answers might be important clues to the ultimate theory of reality. By studying uh, the mysterious properties of black holes, physicists have de uh, deduced absolute limits on how much information a region of space or a quantum uh, quantity of matter and energy can hold. I'm going off live in a few seconds. Um, I will be on for another 15 minutes. And um, if you would like to uh, archive the show or just go right to the website, I'm also going to upload the show to YouTube as well. So please continue listening on. Related results suggest that our universe, which we perceive to have three spatial dimensions, might instead be written on a two-dimensional surface. Like a hologram, our everyday perceptions of the world as three-dimensional would then be either a profound illusion or merely one of the most alternative ways of viewing reality. A grain of sand may not encompass our world, but a flat screen might. All right, I'm going to skip some more of the, uh, the black hole portion. If you want to contact me personally, I can provide that to you. All right, what are the ultimate degrees of freedom? Atoms, after all, are made of electrons and nuclei. Nuclei are algorithms of proteins, um, agglomerations, excuse me, of proteins and neurons, and those in turn are composed of quarks. Many physicists today consider electrons and quarks to be excited, um, excitations of superstrings, which they hypothesize to be the most fundamental entities. But the uh, vicissitudes of century of revelations in physics warn us not to be dogmatic. There could be more levels of structure in our universe than are dreamt of in today's physics. 
One cannot calculate the ultimate information capacity of a chunk of matter, or equivalently, its true thermodynamic entropy without knowing the nature of the ultimate constituents of matter or of the deepest level of structure, which I shall refer to as level X. Um, this is the author of this article. This ambiguity causes no problems in analyzing practical thermodynamics, such as that of car engines, for example, because the quarks within the atoms can be ignored. They do not change their states under the relativity uh, or benign conditions of the engine. Given the dizzying progress in miniaturization, one can playfully con contemplate a day when quarks will serve to store information. One bit a piece, perhaps. How much information would then fit in our one centimeter cube? And how much if we harness superstrings or even deeper, yet undreamt of levels? Surprisingly, developments in gravitation physics in the past three decades have supplied some clear answers to what seem to be elusive questions. The information content of a pile of computer chips increases in proportion with the number of chips or equivalently the volume they occupy. That simple rule must br break down for a large enough pile of chips because eventually the information would exceed the holographic bound, which depends on the surface area, not the volume. The breakdown occurs when the immense pile of chips collapses to form a black hole, black hole thermodynamics. A central player in these developments in the black hole. Black holes are a consequence of general relativity, Albert Einstein's 1915 geometric theory of gravitation. In this theory, gravitation arises from the uh, curvature of space-time, which makes objects move as if they were pulled by a force. Conversely, the curvature is caused by the presence of matter and energy. According to Einstein's equations, a sufficiently dense concentration of matter or energy will curve space-time so extremely that it rends, forming a black hole. The law of relativity forbid anything that went into a black hole from coming out again, at least within the classical non-quantum descriptions of the physics. The point of no return, called the event horizon of the black hole, is of crucial importance. In the simplest case, the horizon is a sphere. Uh, whose surface area is larger for more massive black holes. It is impossible to determine what is inside a black hole. No detailed information can merge across the horizon and escape in, into the outside world. In disappearing forever into a black hole, however, a piece of matter does leave some traces. Its energy, we count any mass as energy in accordance with Einstein's e equals mc squared, is permanently reflected in an increment in the black hole's mass. If the matter is captured while circling the hole, its associated angular momentum is added to the black hole's angular momentum. Both the mass and angular momentum of the black hole are measurable from their effects of, on space-time around the hole. In this way, the laws of conservation of energy and angular momentum are upheld by black holes. Another fundamental law, the second law of thermodynamics, appears to be violated. Holographic space-time. Two universes of different dimensions in obeying disparate Physical laws are rendered completely equivalent uh, by the holographic principle. Theorists have demonstrated this principle mathematically for a specific type of five-dimensional space-time, uh, anti-de Sitter, and its four-dimensional boundary. In effect, the 5D universe is recorded like a hologram on a 4D surface as its periphery. Superstring theory rules in the 5D space-time, but a so-called conformal field theory of point particles operates on the 4D hologram. A black hole in the 5D space-time is equivalent to hot radiation on the hologram. For example, the hole and radiation have the same entropy, even though the physical origin of the entropy is completely different for each case. Although these two descriptions of the universe seem utterly unlike, no experiment could distinguish between them, even in principle. The second law of thermodynamics summarizes the familiar observation that most processes in nature are irreversible. A teacup falls from the table and shatters, but no one has ever seen shards jump up of their own accord and assemble into a teacup. The second law of thermodynamics forbids such inverse pr processes. It states that the entropy of an isolated physical system can never decrease. At best, entropy remains constant and usually it increases. This law is central to physical chemistry and engineering. It is arguably the physical law with the greatest impact outside physics. As First emphasized by Wheeler, when matter disappears into a black hole, its entropy is gone for good, and the second law seems to be transcended, made irrelevant. A clue to resolving this puzzle came in 1970 when Demetrius Christodoulou, then a graduate student of Wheeler's at Princeton and, and uh, Stephen W. Hawking of the University of Cambridge, independently proved that in various processes, such as black hole mergers, the total area of the event horizons never decreases. The analogy with the tendency of entropy to increase led to propose in 1972 that a black hole has entropy proportional to the area of its horizon. 
It was conjectured that when matter falls into a black hole, the increase in black hole entropy always compensates or overcompensates for the lost entropy of matter. Most generally, the sum of black hole's entropies and the ordinary entropy outside the black holes cannot decrease. This is generalized second law, GSL for short. Our innate perception that the world is three-dimensional could be an extraordinary illusion. Hawking's radiation process allowed him to determine the proportionality constant between black hole entropy and the horizon area. Black hole entropy is precisely one quarter of the event horizon's area measured in Planck's areas. The Planck length, about 10 to 33 centimeter, is the fundamental length scale related to gravity and quantum mechanics. The Planck area is its square. Even in thermodynamic terms, this is a vast quantity of entropy. The entropy of a black hole one centimeter in diameter would be about uh, 1066 bits, roughly equal to the thermodynamic entropy of a cube of water 10 billion kilometers on a side. The world as a hologram. The GSL allows us to set boundaries on the information capacity or bounds on the information capacity of any isolated physical system, limits that refer to the information at all levels of structure down to level X. In 1980, he began studying the first sound uh, such bound called the universal entropy bound, which limits how much entropy can be carried by a spe specified mass of specified size. A related idea, the holographic bound, was devised in 1995 by Leonard Susskind of Stanford University. It limits how much entropy can be contained in matter and energy occupying a specified volume of space. In work, uh, excuse me, in his work on the holographic bound, Susskind considered any approximately spherical isolated mass that is not itself a black hole and that fits inside a closed surface of area. A. If the mass can collapse to a black hole, that hole will end up with a horizon area smaller than A. The black hole entropy is therefore smaller than A4. According to the GSL, the entropy of the system cannot decrease, so the mass's original entropy cannot have been bigger than A4. It follows that the entropy of an isolated physical system with boundary area A is necessarily less than A4. What if the mass does not spontaneously collapse? In 2000, he showed that a tiny black hole can be used to convert the system to a black hole not much different from the one in Susskind's argument. The bound is therefore independent of the constitution of the system or of the nature of level X. It just depends on the GSL. We can now answer some of these elusive questions about the ultimate limits of information storage. A device measuring a centimeter across could in principle hold up to 1066 bits, a mind-boggling amount. The visible universe contains at least uh, 10, 100, that's 10,100 bits of entropy, which could in principle be packed inside a sphere a tenth of a light year across. Estimating the entropy of the universe is a difficult problem, however, and much larger numbers requiring a sphere almost as big as the universe itself are entirely plausible. But there's another aspect of a holographic bound that is truly astonishing. Namely, that is the maximum possible entropy depends on the boundary area instead of the volume. Imagine that we are piling up computer memory chips in a big heap. The number of transistors, the total data storage capacity, increases with the volume of the heap. So too does the total thermodynamic entropy of all of the chips. Remarkably, though, the theoretical ultimate information capacity of the space occupied the heap increases only with the surface area. Because volume increases more rapidly than surface area, at some point the entropy of all the chips would exceed the holographic bound. It would seem that either the GSL or common sense ideas of entropy and information capacity must fail. In fact, what fails is the pile itself. It would collapse under its own gravity and form a black hole before that impasse was reached. Thereafter, uh, each additional memory chip would increase the mass of the surface area of black holes in a way that would continue to preserve the GSL. This surprising uh, result that information capacity depends on surface area has a natural explanation in the holographic principle, proposed in 1993 by noblest uh, Gerard T. Hooft of the University of um, Utrecht in the Netherlands, and elaborated by Susskind. It's true. In the everyday world, a hologram is a special kind of photograph that generates a full three-dimensional image when it is illuminated in the right manner. All the information describing the 3D scenes in, is encoded into the pattern of light and dark areas on the two-dimensional piece of film, ready to be regenerated. The holographic principle contends that an analog of this visual magic applies to the full physical description of any system occupying a 3D region. It proposes that another physical theory defined only on the 2D boundary of the region completely describes the 3D physics. If a 3D system can be fully described by a physical theory operating solely on its 2D boundary, 
one would expect the information uh, content of the system not to exceed that of the description of the boundary. All right, a universe painted on its boundary. Can we apply the holographic principle to the universe at large? The real universe is a 4D system. It has volume and extends in time. If the physics of our universe is holographic, there would be an alternative set of physical laws operating on a 3D boundary of space-time somewhere. That would be equivalent to our known 4D physics. We do not uh, yet know of any such 3D theory that works in that way. Indeed, what surface should we use as the boundary of the universe? One step toward realizing these ideas is to study models that are simpler than our real universe. A class of concrete examples of the holographic principle at work involves so-called anti-de Sitter space-times. The original de Sitter space-time is a model universe first obtained by Dutch astronomer uh, William, uh, Willem de Sitter in 1917 a, as a solution of Einstein's equations, including the repulsive force known as the cosmological constant. De Sitter's space-time is empty, expands at an accelerating rate, and is very highly symmetrical. In 1997, astronomers studying distant supernova explosions included that our universe now extend, or expands in an accelerated fashion and will probably become increasingly like a de Sitter space-time in the future. Now, if the repulsion of Einstein's equations is changed to attraction, de Sitter's solution turns into the anti de Sitter space-time, which has equally as much symmetry. More important for the holographic concept, it possesses a boundary which is located at infinity and is a lot like our everyday space-time. Using anti de Sitter space-time, theorists have devised a concrete example of the holographic principle at work. A universe described by superstring theory functioning in an anti de Sitter space-time is completely equivalent to a quantum field theory operating on the boundary of that space-time. Thus, the full majesty of the superstring theory is an anti de Sitter universe is painted on the boundary of the universe. Juan Maldacena, uh, then at Harvard University, first conjectured such a relation in 1997 for the 5D anti de Sitter case, and it was later confirmed for many situations by Edward Witten of the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, and Stephen S. Gruber, Igor R. Klebanov, and Alexander M. Pol Polyakov of Princeton University. Examples of this holographic correspondence are now known for space-times with a variety of dimensions. This result means that two um, ostensibly very different theories, not even acting in spaces of the same dimensions, are equivalent. Creatures living in one of these universes would be incapable of determining if they inhabited a 5D universe described by string theory or a 4D1 uh, described by a quantum field theory of point particles. The holographic equivalence can also or can allow a difficult a calculation in the 4D boundary space-time, such as the behavior of quarks and gluons, to be traded for another. Easier calculation in the highly symmetric 5D anti de Sitter space-time. The correspondence works uh, the other way, too. Witten has shown that a black hole in an anti de Sitter space-time corresponds to hot radiation in the alternative physics operating in the bounding space-time. The entropy of the whole, a deeply mysterious concept, equals the radiation's entropy, which is quite mundane. The expanding universe. I'm going to skip uh, uh, that portion of the expanding uh, universe as well um, to get beyond the entropy. Uh, but you know, I think it's important to to really look at um, a lot of what's what's uh, going on and the nature of reality. Um, now, we talked about. Uh, we talked about like many of these things when it comes to how the mind works in consciousness, and consciousness runs the uh, you know uh, should be running the mind, having the heart lead the mind, and consciousness running the vehicle. All right, now I want to get into a, a small little section here before I run out of uh, recorded time here. Even visions and experiences involving non-ordinary reality became explainable under the holographic paradigm. In his book, Gifts of Unknown Things, biologist Lyle Watson describes his encounter with an Indonesian shaman woman who, by performing a ritual dance, uh, you know, and this is what I mentioned before, to make trees disappear in thin air. You know, basically, uh, it shows that uh, what we perceive as reality is only a canvas, uh, that we can be able to do what we need to do with it. Now, I need to uh, touch on one thing as I conclude here. I apologize for the quickness of the show. There's a lot of information to go over. But um, I will conclude by reminding my listeners that we are all one consciousness experiencing this holographic third-dimensional illusion through different perspectives. Let us remember who and what we really are and change the hologram into something beautiful. But we must all first resonate with love and understanding our interconnection to all things, changing the internal source of the external collective projection. 
everything is holographic in nature. And this is just a recap of what we've been talking about. But all things that we perceive with our senses, our five sense illusion of reality, is in waveform pattern. Once there's an observer of these waveforms, they become particle form. But their particle form and waveform still um, as opportunities of, of uh, what we want to perceive. Once we focus on this,